Limerick is where our next guest, Patrick Collison, grew up. At age 10, Patrick taught himself to code. At age 16, he won the prestigious Top Young Scientist Award presented to him at the time by the President of Ireland. Soon afterwards, Pat and his younger brother, John, came to the US and enrolled in MIT. While there, they began work with their first startup, later moving, later moving to the West Coast. With the support of Y Combinator, they partnered with two Oxford graduates and formed Octomatic. Within 10 months, this was acquired for $5 million. So while still in their teens, Patrick and John became millionaires. Seven years ago, the guys set out to build a payment, payment platform that would enable any company to sell their products anywhere in the world. And so Stripe was born. Can you all please be upstanding and give a big startup welcome to Patrick Collison, co-founder of Stripe. Hey, Pat. Well, thank you for being here. Thanks very much for having being me. Being back. Exactly, I'm excited to, to be back here. So when we, when we, we, we first chatted in 2012, uh, it was the first time you, you spoke at a startup grind, and um, let, me, let me just say a couple of things if I can about Stripe, and then, and then we'll get to some of the, some of the questions. But um, this is not me pandering to Patrick, but this is truth. In college, I sold merchant accounts. I was one of those terrible people. Really? Yes. I did not uh, know that. In startup, I was like customer service selling merchant, $1,500 merchant accounts. Huh. Terrible. And um, as soon as I heard about Stripe, people would ask, I, it, it like, I was like, wow, that model is terrible. This is the future. And for years, people would ask me, like, if you could go work at any startup, what startup would you go to? And I always, for years, I would say Stripe, because both because of you and, and John, uh, but also the problem that you were solving seems so big and so huge. Uh, that, that, that's so interesting, because when we used to describe Stripe to people early on, uh, the, the most common reaction by far was kind of blank stares, right? And that this is sort of you know, weird, and I don't get how it's better than any of the existing things, or whatever. Like, people really, truly did, did not get it. Um, uh, but then people who had dealt with online payments before, which is of course you know, a small minority, but people who had dealt with it firsthand were like, wait, shit, this is awesome, uh, you know, this needs to exist, whatever. And so uh, I guess uh, you all seemed to get it early on, but I didn't well, realize you had this additional context. Well, it's easy, and, it, and it's easy now, it's easy to look back and say it's obvious, right? And, and, and great ideas can be like that. But how, tell us, how has Stripe evolved since those early days, both, both in terms of the products and you know, the, the customers that you service? Right, right. So I think basically we've evolved in um, you know, th three major axes. Uh, the, the, the first one is just the, the, the breadth of products we offer, right? And we, we started out with an incredibly limited uh, product offering, right? You could basically charge, uh, you could charge credit cards uh, if your business was in the US in US dollars and really not a whole lot more besides, right? And th that was kind of sufficient that we could kind of get you know, some initial traction from it and so on, but you know, we, we, we really weren't doing a whole lot. And if you wanted to expand your business internationally or if you wanted to sort of do something more complicated than just charging cards, like maybe implement a marketplace or build a subscription business, whatever, you know, there wasn't a whole lot that we could do for you. So there's been a lot of just kind of product expansion to, to cover more functionality that it turns out uh, technology companies want to, to go and take advantage of. Um, second axis is, uh, is just making Stripe available to more businesses. And so we started out only available to businesses in the US. Uh, we're now available to businesses in, well, kind of 25 countries directly. And then now through Atlas, uh, we have businesses in more than 100 countries. Uh, and then the third axis is just expanding the, the kinds of customers that we address, right? In the beginning, it was sort of small, you know, early stage startups because, you know, we weren't really a known quantity. Uh, and so, you know, th they thought they were taking some degree of risk by building on top of Stripe. Whereas now we have public companies and Fortune 500 companies and, you know, really large enterprises mm -hmm. trying to, you know, migrate their businesses and, and, and uh, to, to, to sort of the internet digital economy uh, and sort of increasingly building on top of Stripe, which means for us, you know, we have to kind of, uh, we've had to adapt somewhat in terms of how we deal with them and so on. And so it, it's, it's been sort of the same direction, but, but kind of progressing on those, I'd say, primarily those three axes. How, how have you changed? I don't know, you have to ask everyone else that. Um, well, I, I spend, I used you to spend. You still, I think, wear, like, I think that's like your shirt. Is it? <laughs> I, I'm do you not, have, like, I'm 100 not, of those shirts? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm not one of those people. You know, <laughs> it's, it's written a lot, you know, because you have to make so many decisions every day. You have to wear the same clothes. I'm like, shit, you know, it's not that hard to do the t-shirt. But um, uh, so, um, uh, uh, 
I used to spend all my day uh, writing code, right? And it's all these photos of early Stripe, and you know, I have the headphones on, and in my jacket, and it's late at night, and whatever, and just writing code all day. And sadly, those days no longer exist. Uh, and so I spend my day kind of helping recruit people, meeting with people, reviewing products, and, and all of that. So all, all, all that stuff has changed. Is how I've changed. I've had to get more OK with, um, with not going to live as an introvert. Uh, I think my, my, my inner self would ideally just be holed up you know, by itself, myself, every day, and can't do that. How, how has starting a business in, in 2011 changed versus, say, starting a business, a, a technology company today? What do, what do you think? It, how has the landscape changed in just five or six years? That's a good question. Um, you know, the, the, the obvious answer, which kind of everyone will tell you, and we all, I think, know to some degree, is kind of in so many ways it's gotten easier, right? Uh, in that, you know, you have the AWS, and you have the Twilio, and Stripe, and, you know, I think many traditional firms, like even law firms and, and folks like that, have sort of come to understand that this is an important market and have sort of adapted themselves to better service and fee deferrals and things like that. Uh, a, a lot of other entities and organizations kind of give um, you know, various kinds of credits and stuff like that. Obviously, the kind of the incubator or accelerator Kind of community has has really blossomed, and so you know, folks like YC, 500 startups, etc., have have really broadened their reach. And you know, even if you're not obviously here in the U.S., I think there's kind of far more on the ground help. I think culturally it's changed. So that I mean, when we started a company, and you know, we, we weren't we were living in the U.S. at the time, right? But uh, even when I was in college, starting a startup was like a pretty weird thing, and that people are like, you know, were you not able to get a job? Um, uh, whereas now, I think there's kind of some degree of kind of cultural acceptance around it. So I, I think all those things have changed. Uh, I think the thing that has not changed uh, is I don't think it's substantially easier to, to, to find a truly underserved niche and, and to build a good product to service. And that, I mean, that is the core essence of a startup. And I don't think that has gotten substantially easier. Um, and if anything, I think that because of the dominance uh, of the giants, right, the, the, the Googles, the Facebooks, the Amazons, the, um, uh, the, the, the Apples, and so on, uh, you know, those are wonderful companies. Um, uh, but because, because they are so good, uh, I think it, it kind of, like, in, in, in the previous generation, uh, you had these kind of slightly sleepy, ossified tech companies that maybe you know, weren't that good at sort of responding nimbly and kind of keeping up with the, the new kind of competitive threats. Yeah. I think the current generation of big tech companies, they're actually really good at responding to competitive threats. Uh, and so I think that, that, that actually makes life a little bit harder for, for, well, for startups. And, they may, and many of the old ones never evolved, and they're, they're kind of irrelevant now. Right, right, exactly. Um, but, Where they know, were the big companies 10 years, even just 10 years ago. Totally. Right? Uh, whereas I think that you know the, the Jeff Bezos's and the Sundars and the, the Zuckerbergs and so on, like they're, they're good at these responses. They get it. Uh, I mean, they, they were the usurpers themselves, so they understand the mentality. Um, and so what, part of what we're seeing is f much more um, uh, opportunity and, 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 and just faster growth, honestly, uh, outside the US. And I think it's in part because you know, that, that dynamic isn't quite as pronounced in, in many other parts of the world. Uh, so I remember very clearly in the early days of Stripe that when you launched, you launched in you know, US dollars was the only currency you accepted. And I remember, I don't know if it was in the comments or in you know, message forums or whatever, but reading people kind of scolding you guys like, well, I'm in Australia, when am I going to get this? And I'm in the UK and I'm, you know, and I'm here and I'm here. And so um, what was very interesting is like how you guys, very complicated, difficult, heavily regulated industry. Yes. And we haven't ever read about Stripe like, oh, Stripe had to, you know, you know, in a huge lawsuit with, uh, with Ecuador or something like that. You know, like, you seem to very methodically move through these different countries and currencies, and from the outside looks like a very smooth, simple, it's obviously not simple, but seems like a smooth, simple process. From a managing and running a company standpoint, how did you and your team prioritize, right. we're going to do this and this and this, and we're just going to like, we know there's money there right now, yeah. but we need to get this off yeah. first. Look, it's painful, right? In that uh, most tech products, you know, you, you can sort of offer them globally from day one, and maybe you want to localize them more over time or something, but you, know, you launch Twitter, and it, it is intrinsically global you know, from, from, from the start um, uh, uh, in a way that sort of Stripe really, as, as you point out, sort of acutely wasn't. And like, we read those comments, and you know, we feel bad, right? We, we, we totally want to serve those. Uh, those companies, and in some way we could, uh, like uh, in some cases maybe there are some kind of infrastructural things we need to build or you know plug into the local banking rails or whatever. But uh, sort of the, the, the main impediment is, as you say, uh, sort of you know there are all these kind of 
you know, different local regulatory considerations and, and ways we need to adapt and report and, and, and so on. And we wish we could do that faster, right? And you know, partially that's sort of us building the internal competency to solve it and, and, and everything. Uh, and partially it's you know, just often we're waiting for, for local regulators uh, in, in these countries. In fact, there's one particular product in one particular market that we're really, really excited to launch right now. And we're just we're waiting on the local regulator to sort of get back uh, uh, mm -hmm. with an opinion. Um, now, uh, as, it, as it happens, I, um, uh, I spoke at, at, at YC last week, and you know, and, and I get this question sort of a lot from different founders. You know, people were asking um, uh, uh, how sort of Stripe thought about these regulatory questions, given that sort of as, as as tech companies, I think, sort of are going from being pure sort of internet businesses, you know, the Facebooks, the Googles, the Yahoo's, the things that exist purely on the internet, sort of increasingly entering other sectors, you know, the Airbnbs and the Ubers and so on, where you're sort of, you're actually getting involved in the real world. Concomitant sort of with that trend, I think there, there's sort of people are increasingly having to contend with, with regulation and, and the law and governments and, and all the rest. And so there's a question as a startup of, you know, how should I approach it? How should I think about it? Uh, and, you know, there's, uh, pe people will occasionally, um, uh, sort of, you know, slight nod, wink, better to uh, ask for forgiveness than to seek permission and so on, which, you know, at least in our domain, although I think in, in quite a number of others as well, I, I don't think that's a good idea. And I think that actually the approach of, uh, uh, of engaging with, with government and regulators and actually just kind of buttoning things up pretty well from an early stage, that's actually in some ways, I think, an underrated strategy. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, our general counsel was one of our first hires at the company, and, you yeah. know, we now have a, a pretty significant internal legal function, and, and it is exactly what you say, this you know, methodical and, and in some ways painful in how long it takes process of gradually getting to complete availability. My, my, uh, Michael Moritz said uh, Sequoia is famous for not ever selling any stock that he, mm. uh, in companies that he, uh, that he invests in, even Google stock, which he still holds to this day. Right. Um, and um, I can only imagine, although I have no inside information to this, but that you have had lots of opportunities to sell your company. It's a great company, and, it, you know, and it's, you know, you're doing an amazing thing. What I wonder is why and how have you been able within yourself to say, no, we're going to keep going. I see further because we see this. We see people miss. We see people hit. Again, sitting here in 2017, it's it's quite obvious and easy to see that this is a future of payments on the internet. And but very difficult to see in 2012. Very difficult, to, impossible to see in 2011 when you're in Buenos Aires with your brother coding this thing up. So what to you has kept you saying, no, you know what? Like I'm going to I'm going to keep going. We're going to keep building this thing and and you know, what, what has done that for you? Well, I, I don't think um, I don't think I could ever kind of speak to the broad version of sort of people you know, selling their companies versus not, you know, because obviously there's so much that's kind of company specific about that, right? And, you know, it's, it's easy to say that sort of, you know, the, the advice is often given, you know, you should never sell, you should always kind of resist the acquirers and so on. And, you know, I think that in many of those cases, it, it probably is actually the right decision to sell, either because the trajectory, you know, eventually was going to peter out for whatever reason, uh, or, uh, or maybe you can, in fact, do bigger things uh, at the acquirer. Like, I suspect it was a good decision for, you know, Android to sell to Google, right? Um, or for, or yeah. for Keyhole with Google Maps. And, yeah, or and, Instagram and, or whatever. Uh, right, right. Um, so, uh, in the Stripe case, um, I, I think, honestly, the main reason is because uh, I, I think if the decision, if the kind of the framework you're using to make the decision uh, is, uh, is, is a financial one, at some point, the relative, relative expected values, you're going to think it's actually better to sell than to not. And, and that only needs to happen once, right? And then you're sold, done. That's you right. can never make that decision again. And so I think it has to be something sort of deeper. And in our case, the whole reason we work on it, um, and, uh, and this was kind of from a quite early stage, was because we, just personally speaking, we get really excited about all the new things that are getting created on the internet, all the new sort of te technological phenomena, companies, products that are now possible. And we think that sort of Stripe can help enable more of them and to sort of increase the success rate of them because they can address bigger markets, they can enter countries they weren't in before, new business models are possible. And, and, and it's, it's sort of that kind of I don't want to make, sound too grandiose in saying it's kind of that principle-oriented thing, but it, it's, it's, it's that effect in the world. And like, you know, in, in, in 10, 15 years, how are we going to think about, was it worthwhile to work on Stripe? It's not going to be what was the eventual fi financial return. I mean, you know, we, we hope for the sake of everyone at the company that it's good, but really the main way we're going to assess it uh, is in terms of 
how much more vibrant um, is the entire technology sector? How much more does sort of the internet economy flourish? Uh, and you know, when you think about it that way, think about acquisitions, it, it kind of becomes an easier decision where it just, it's hard to see how it would help you know, further those goals. Well said. Um, our audience is hugely international, and so is yours. Um, you and your brother are from Ireland, right? Uh, outside of Limerick. Um, and uh, tell us, how did Ireland impact the way that you built your product and mm. run your company, and or has it not had an impact? Um, well, I think Stripe always had. Uh, you know, it's funny. A, a lot of American companies, and I'm sure many of you here in the audience have experienced this. Will you know talk a lot about sort of international. Uh, you know, as if like there's the U.S. and then there are these you know strange international places outside. You know, there we dragons. Um, uh, and uh, and I think you know, fortunately, because we ourselves were from international. Uh, we, we, we sort of d didn't quite approach it the same way, and I guess we just thought it was a freaking bug in Stripe that we weren't available instead of every country, rather than being this kind of weird, interesting, long-term avenue for expansion. Uh, and in terms of the people at the company, like qu from a quite early stage, uh, sort of a very significant, uh, you know, composition uh, or orientation of the composition towards immigrants. I don't actually know what the, the, the current stat is, but you know, last time we counted, about, about a third of the company was working outside of the country of their birth, right? Uh, and you know, and the, that, that sort of goes all the way uh, you know, to the leadership where our, our chief business officer, um, the guy who you know, deals with all, all of our partnerships, you know, financial industry uh, uh, sort of interactions and so on, you know, he grew up in Honduras. Hmm. Um, and so I, I think having that in the culture was helpful, and you know, we started taking uh, expansion outside the US, fixing this bug seriously earlier than we, than we otherwise might have. And I think it influenced our thinking with things like Atlas, where I mean, the, the, the whole kind of the economy of Ireland these days is very predicated on sort of uh, on, on being outward looking and figuring out how Ireland can be a really good hub for, you know, for, for global operations, right? And when you think about Atlas, that, that's essentially exactly what we're doing. Sort of we're helping people who might be in you know, Egypt. Tell people what Atlas is, if they uh, don't know. Uh, so, so Atlas is a service that we launched actually this month last year uh, that helps you incorporate a company in Delaware. Um, so you know, the obviously standard incorporation hub for sort of all tech uh, companies here in the US. Incorporate a company in Delaware, uh, get a US bank account with Silicon Valley Bank, uh, get a US Stripe account so you can accept you know, payments from customers all around the world, uh, and get sort of uh, tax and legal advice just to kind of uh, get you off the ground, um, and some hosting credits and some other you know, things like this. So basically, it's kind of all the, the basic legal, the kind of mech the mechanics of the infrastructure that you need in order to just kind of get off the ground. And the crucial detail is you can get all this stuff no matter where you yourself are based, mm -hmm. right? And so you can be an entrepreneur in, in Kenya, in Egypt, in Indonesia, in Bolivia, right? Uh, and you can sort of get you, know, you can pay the U.S. government taxes. <laughs> well, this is the thing. Everyone always goes to the tax question, but you know, as you well know better than almost anyone, you talk to the entrepreneurs in these countries, yeah. they're not worried about what the tax rate no, is. They're worried about, like, can they get this thing off the ground Absolutely. and compete on a level footing, on an equal playing yeah. field with all these U.S. startups, yeah, right? Yeah, they don't say, hey, you're in Kenya, you're in Seattle, I'm going you know, to go with this product. Uh, yeah, and like, you know, if, you know, if, if, if you can't, sort of compete again on a level footing on an equal playing field. You know, you go to try, try to raise money or to partner with someone else, whatever, and you know, if you're kind of just you know, weirdly set up from the vantage point of the investor because you know, they don't know, you know that particular legal construct or whatever, you know, that, that, that can be like a huge impediment. And so it's not about sort of the marginal tax rate, it's about like this binary existence versus not, right? right. Um, and, uh, and you know, when we survey Atlas companies, 60% uh, of them, like 60, tell us they would not have been able to get started wow. if not for Atlas. Um, uh, and so, uh, so anyway, I, I think things like that were sort of in large part informed by the experience of sort of growing up in uh, this very kind of outward looking um, uh, you know, country of, of immigrants. Yeah, and we, you know, we, we were happy to be part of that and, and our, our community loves it and it's obvious why they would love it. And you know, if I was, in, you know, we've had entrepreneurs all over the world that have signed up through it, so. Yeah, no, I, I think Startup program. Grind has, you know, given the, the breadth of the global presence, you know, it's a lot of the same mentality. How, how, how um, what major shifts and trends in entrepreneurs, uh, you know, in entrepreneurship should we be tracking? What, what do you think, if you're starting your company today, what, what are you looking at? What are you keeping an eye on? Um, right. um,
You know, I, I, I think it's always a little bit difficult to sort of speak of the trends in general because, yes, there are these kind of winds of fashion that sort of blow through the, the, the tech sector. Um, but you know, generally speaking, in these categories, it's, it's kind of only one or two companies that end up making it kind of long term, right? Yeah. I mean, if you look back at social gaming, which of course was you know super hot for a while back, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, or you know social networking for a while, and and, and so on, you know, you, you you generally have a fairly small number of victors. And so I think that kind of from the vantage point of the entrepreneur, it's better to think about just intrinsically what's a good idea, ignoring uh, what what's you know currently hot. Um, uh, and, and not only not gravitating the, towards the things that are you know, presently popular, but in fact maybe sort of trying to think about what's popular currently so you can in fact steer clear of it, right? Um, and that, that at least applies to the business model level. Um, I, the, we've kind of mentioned this, but, but one that, that really is very acutely apparent to us right now is, uh, well, actually I'll give you two. Um, first is, uh, again, this idea of just Tech is going from being a kind of purely tech, a purely internet, a purely web-based phenomenon, uh, sort of in, fracking into other industries and sort of digitizing other industries, right? Figuring out how can you take this existing sector, this thing that's been done for decades, centuries, whatever, and build the internet-enabled version of it, right? And that is you know, proceeding at a breakneck pace. And I'm sure you guys, I'm sure many of you here in the audience are kind of working on, on companies of that nature. And I think that's a really promising direction for the foreseeable future uh, because you know, uh, there are so many industries and businesses that are going to become kind of significantly different as a result of the injection of technology. And generally speaking, it's pretty difficult for the incumbents uh, to react to that. So that's one. Second is um, tech is now uh, uh, really working uh, sort of outside of Western Europe and North America, right? And I think kind of Western Europe and North America have not yet woken up to this fact as much as they, they, they should, but you know, majority of internet users are of course um, uh, outside of uh, you know, the, 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 these regions. Um, I, th I think in the not too distant future, sort of a majority of the like tech company wealth <laughs> uh, is is going to be sort of in companies built uh, uh, outside of these regions. And you know, in, in again, say if you take the U.S. here, like a lot of the major markets, you know, there are I don't know if the long-term winners have been kind of defined yet, but you know, there's some pretty you know, well-run, competent companies uh, addressing the sort of the major needs. There's just like way more open canvas uh, in in uh, in these more distant places. Um, and, and yet, they now have sort of, you know, it depends on the country, but sort of smartphone, smartphone penetration is generally rising quickly and, and you know, rapidly reaching saturation point. Uh, internet connections are rapidly improving. The basic infrastructure for commerce in the internet is, is developing, and you know, we obviously are sort of trying to advance that as quickly as we can. And so we, uh, again, I mentioned I was at uh, YC last week, uh, the, the, the sort of international composition um, uh, of, of founders at YC, uh, you, you can see it right there, where sort of the, the it, YC is becoming more, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it's less dominated by U.S. founders, and so just generally, we think that phenomenon, and again, this comes back to things like Atlas, is going to be sort of a really big deal for you know, ten years to come. A lot of growth. Yeah. What? Um, how is internet commerce evolving? Man, um, that sounds like a, a, an essay question for a class. Um, I think that I, I, I think that it's ceasing to be about. Internet commerce, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in at the st like again, there used to be sort of um, you know internet commerce was this weird special thing, and occasionally you know you'd order your book or your shoes or whatever on the internet, right? Whereas when you think about you know some of the services that we use on our phones or or the things we book on our phones and the, the how kind of the nature of the the, the transaction is evolving, um, I, 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 like there's just commerce, and then there's kind of legacy commerce where there's no no internet involved in it. And then there's kind of the, the more modern version, but I, I think basically the distinction is, is, is dissolving. Um, and, and you know, we sometimes think about it you know, with our kind of Stripe hats on, sort of what fraction of internet commerce uh, does kind of Stripe address or support or enable or whatever. But I think at some point in the not too distant future, we're going to stop thinking about it that way. We'll just look at the denominator as being global commerce because, again, that distinction is just becoming less meaningful. Um, you work with your brother. True. Do you guys ever fight? <laughs> <laughs> like, like all brothers, we have never fought. Um, uh, and, and, no, not I'm not talking about Tommy. I'm talking about <laughs> that, um, This is three of us, myself, John, Tommy. Um, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm almost two years older, right? And so yeah, when, when so we do right. fight, it means I'm right, yeah, exactly. Sure. Um, but um, uh, no, look, I mean, I think that when um, 
you, you look at kind of successful companies, right? Yeah. Uh, and and you're not calling Stripe yet successful. You know, we, we we have a long way to go. But when you look at the the sort of the really kind of top tier companies uh, and the trajectories they followed, it's pretty rare, um, surprisingly so, that the co-founders, you know, totally, yeah, r remain together, right? Um, and you know, it's freaking stressful. Like the thing that no one, uh, I wish I had better understood when we started Stripe is like, you know that when you start a company that like if it doesn't go well, if the product doesn't work, if you don't get the traction you want, whatever, it's gonna suck, right? You're gonna have all these problems, you're gonna be miserable and you know, it's just gonna be a, a tough time. What nobody tells you is that if it works, on the flip side, you're also going to have all these problems, and you're often going to be miserable, and you're going to be putting out fires. And so actually, you're like guaranteed misery in sort of I I either <laughs> path. Um, and so in that sense, you're also guaranteed sort of co-founder, you know, I don't quite say strife, but you know, there's going to be significant problems to be solved and tension and uh, challenges and all of the rest. And I think having had, you know, before we started Stripe, you know, almost 20 years of experience um, resolving disputes uh, and, 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 and hopefully our, our mechanisms for doing so became a little bit more sophisticated or at least a little bit more verbal over time. But, um, uh, but, but I, I genuinely think that you know, was a helpful foundation. Do you, do you get angry about stuff? <laughs> um, and I, and I, I mean, because like I, I've talked to hundreds of founders and you, there's something that's very unique about you is you are just, you seem so like just even keel. And I know you're incredibly passionate about, and you can hear it just listening to you talk, but like I just, like so many founders are just sort of volatile animals, you know? <laughs> and we just, we're high, we're low, we're, we're like having the best day of our lives, we're having the worst day of our lives, and that's like by noon. <laughs> and, and I like, and I think about you sometimes, and I think like, this is something that's really unique to me about you is like you just seem to just be sort of steady Eddie as they say in the US like like you you I don't know and, and maybe it's well, just I haven't seen uh, well, it maybe you get yeah, back in the, the office the, like, the, the punching Patrick's bag is back, back there you know but I like I just don't see you yeah. Well, you know, for, for, for Freud, I think this is apocryphal. I don't think he actually said it, but he's supposed to have said um, uh, uh, again this is Freud that um, uh, the, the um, uh, the only people impervious to psychoanalysis are the Irish, uh, and so you know. Again, maybe I can just <laughs> ch ch chalk it up to my uh, to, to my origins. But uh, look, no, no, I, I basically don't get angry, and you know, sometimes I wonder maybe I should because you know it's not like people don't uh, do things that I think, in some sense, logically maybe do I should be angry, get angry about. Right now, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is a great interview. Um, uh, but look, look, I, I think that. Um, uh, I mean, how do you how do you do that? Like, how do you with how do you with all the madness going on, right? Like, I just like how do you how do you not get so down? How do you how do you not get so up? Like, how do you how do you just sort of is there something you can teach us about the way that you do that? Um, that which I feel like is a really unique skill that just a lot of people don't have. Well, I really don't want to claim that it's. Um, um, I, I don't know that it's necessarily good, right? I mean, I look at other founders and the kind of people I think you, ha you have in mind and like, they're so passionate and fervent and fire breathing that I'm like, you know, maybe I should try to cough more fire. Um, uh, uh, and then I sort of try to go do it in the mirror. It's like, no, it's not working. But um, uh, I, I do think that, uh, again, Facebook, I, I think, had the sort of internal um, uh, mantra for, at least I've heard it attributed to them, I don't know, you know to what degree it was really manifested in practice, but you know, you're never as good as they say you are you know, when things are going well and, and you're never as bad as they sort of uh, claim or, or, or sort of criticize you as a sort of being uh, when, when things are going poorly. And I think sort of, exactly as you say, like the, so much shit happens, things Things go right, things go wrong, you know, every day uh, inside of a startup. Again, especially if things are going well, just because you know more things are happening over time. Uh, but I think the value of, um, uh, of, of of an even keel increases. And one thing I will say is that so this morning, I, you know, we, we welcomed sort of a new class of people to Stripe. Uh, and I, you know, I, I sat down with them for an hour and a half to try to sort of describe some of you know Stripe's mission and goals and uh, how we kind of think about the how we work together and so on. Um, 
And something over time that I've come to realize uh, that's like an incredibly important characteristic in the startups is sort of the right kind of optimism. Um, uh, and this is a little bit different to the even keel, uh, but kind of per the point we're just discussing, uh, where if things go well, if you're lucky enough for things to go well, you're still going to have all these problems, right? Mm. And so an easy response to all those problems is you look around and you're like, huh, there are so many problems, like seven things are literally on fire, right? Um, and you're not wrong, right? Th those problems really do exist. But I think it's sort of a, a particular mentality uh, that's kind of required where you can observe those problems, you can diagnose them, you can prioritize them, you can go fix them, whatever, right? Uh, and yet somehow sort of maintain the, the confidence and the belief and the optimism that like, well, they, they can be solved, they will be solved, things will be better in the future or whatever, right? But you can't be, you know, Lego movie, everything is awesome about it, right? Uh, because, you know, if, 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 if these people are sort of whistling along cheerily, being like, everything is great, you know, and you're completely oblivious to these, you know, smoldering um, uh, ashes around you, then you know, that, that sort of has its own set of challenges. And so something that I now pay much more attention to, you know, as we think about hiring and, and uh, all of the rest is, who has, like, the right combination of ability to truly spot the problems and, and like, be, be, you know, have a very kind of fine attention to detail there, but somehow still maintain the optimism. And I think it's so important because you cannot remain sane if you don't have it, uh, and because uh, both optimism and pessimism, pessimism in startups, I think, become self-fulfilling prophecies. Uh, and so, like, it, it's not just that it's a more kind of um, rewarding, fulfilling existence if you can maintain it, but it actually is going to become true over time. And uh, again, I, it, that, that's a learning that I wish I'd come to sooner. Well, and, the, and as you said, which is a good insight, uh, that regardless whether it goes well or not, those things are still going to happen. Absolutely. absolutely. And, and of course, pe pe people don't, um, don't appreciate this enough because, um, you know, of, of course, it's in the interest of all the companies that, that succeed to try to sort of quietly elide those details, right? And that, you know, Google is a, a wonderful, spectacular company. And like so much crazy stuff happened in the early days of Google, but you know, if you go to the sort of company history page, you know, they're not outlining. Right, it's not like, on Wikipedia. That, that time that we thought there was a good idea to get rid of all engineering managers, um, <laughs> which is in fact a thing that happened. Um, uh, and so I think kind of because of that, people have sort of a way too rosy-eyed kind of vision uh, or inversion of, uh, of what kind of the, the early days of, of these now very successful companies are like. And you know, you have all these problems, and you're like, uh, it really exacerbates the imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. Because you're like, well, Google and Facebook, they were so well run, right? Whereas we can't even do an X or a Y or a Z, right? Uh, whereas in fact, you know, those, those companies were, problems. and, and co at the time, people, you know, people really worried for them. They didn't even know if they were going to make them just because that, that's the nature of these things. As we just close here, could you tell us six years later, after starting the company, what, what part of your mission or what you're doing is most exciting to you right now? being causally responsible for having more successful technology companies get started. So simple. <laughs> Patrick Paulson, thank Great. you very, very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. All right. Go ahead.